In today's video, we're going to continue our exploration of the EHX LPB1 pedal, and we're going to specifically be looking at the variations of this pedal. There's one built up on the prototyping pedal here. We'll look at treble boost versions, bass boost versions, we'll do an audio demo of the different versions with guitar, we'll look at the version with 1 mega ohm and 100k bias resistors, and then we'll go on reverb and have a look at some of the versions and try and see inside some of them. Then we'll have a look at a modern PCB and see what extra components are involved in meeting modern specifications. I'm Stu from Music Technology, let's get to it. So here I am in the Falstad emulation software and I've set up the modern circuit and I've added the 2M2 pull down resistor and the 100K on the output. I've set up a frequency sweep over here from 20 Hertz, 20 kilohertz. So I can look at the output across that frequency range and that's reflected in the oscilloscope here at the bottom. And you can see with our standard circuit, the one that we've been looking at for the last few weeks, we're getting what we expect. It's filtering out some of the low frequencies, but we're mainly getting a boost of all the frequencies that are important to us. Now there's two derivations of this circuit. One is a treble booster called the Screaming Bird or the Screaming Tree. And the other one is a bass booster called the Mole or the Hog's Foot. So what's the difference? So let's start with the treble booster because that's fairly easy. All we have to do is reduce this 100 nanofarad capacitor and this 100 nanofarad capacitor down to a much lower value, um, 2.2 nanofarads actually, and this one as well. And that's gonna block a lot more bass on our signal. And if you look at the oscilloscope at the bottom, you'll see now that we're only boosting treble frequencies. That's the only difference. So you can see the tonal shaping potential here. Now, the other one is the bass boost. And you probably worked out already that these are much higher on the bass boost. They are in fact 3.3 microfarads. And I'll take this one up. But if you watch what this does to the signal, you'll see that it's not really boosting the bass, not in the way that we want it to. And there's, in fact, some strangeness going on down here. So what we need to do is shunt some of the high frequencies to ground, to AC ground, by um, bypassing some of these resistors with capacitors. So what we can do is redeploy those 100N capacitors. So if we put one here, and then connect that to ground, and then I'll change its value to 100N. That's one on the input, and then if we take one on the output here, and we take that to ground, and if you're wondering why I'm taking it to nine volts and not ground, if you remember, nine volts is effectively AC ground, so to an AC signal, that is ground as well. So you can consider this signal being shunted to ground as well as this signal. Um, and I need to change the value of that, of course, otherwise we get a strange looking output. Here we go, this is much more like it. So this now is a bass booster and it rolls off the high frequencies. So this is the mole or the hog's foot circuit. And that is basically the difference between all of those three circuits, all with this common emitter amplifier at their heart. So now let's move back onto the breadboard and have a look at this in reality. So here I have the linear power booster circuit on my prototyping pedal. And I'm around our corner frequency again here around like 53, 54 hertz, as you remember from the last video. And I've still got my 100 nanofarad capacitors. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap them out with these. These are the two 0.2 nanofarad capacitors and then we can have a look at the frequency change on here and see if it's reflective of what we saw in Falstad. So you'll see around this corner frequency now we're getting a lot less input as you'd expect from a treble booster and now I've swapped out those capacitors. So if we jump up a scale here you'll see we're getting a larger signal and then if I increase the frequency here you should see, as you'd expect from a treble booster, that the signal is growing as we go up in frequency. So now let's swap out those capacitors for the ones that are in the bass boost version, the mole, and see what happens. Okay, so I've now wired in the extra capacitors for the bass boost version of this, the mole, 
and you can see here we've got a lot more energy down here at the corner frequency now and as I go up you'll expect this to decrease instead of increase which I'm glad to see that it is because this is now a bass boost circuit let me jump up a scale you can see we've got a lot less up here and as I decrease the frequency it increases in amplitude So what we saw in Falstad is also reflected here on the breadboard. So here I've got my Telecaster going into the prototyping pedal. The variations of the circuit are set up on here. And that's just going straight into this focus right to hopefully give you as clean sound from the pedal as possible, although the bass version is still distorting the uh, preamp a little bit. This is the standard LPB1 boost circuit with 100 nanofarad capacitors. Here we have the mole or the hog's foot with the electrolytic capacitors. And I'm using four U7s because I don't have any three U3s in stock. So that's 4.7 microfarads. Um, but the actual pedal uses 3.3 microfarads. And then my 100N capacitors are here bypassing R2 and RC. These are now two N2s, 2.2 nanofarads. So this is the Screaming Bird or the Screaming Tree treble booster. Okay, so hopefully that serves to point out some of the sonic differences between the circuits. Now, obviously, if you're using it in a proper guitar setup with a much bigger amp, you'll probably get a better sound out of that bass boost that I did there. And indeed, a Telecaster doesn't really need any help in the treble department. But just to give you a quick idea of kind of the sonic differences when played with a guitar, because we spend a lot of our time looking at these circuits from an electronic point of view but ultimately they're meant to be played. Here I have the same circuit it might look a little bit different because I've just shifted my frequency sweep to here but it's still being applied to the base of the transistor exactly as it was in the circuit before and the reason that I've done this is because in some versions there's this change of these biasing resistors on the base from 430k and 43k like in our circuit to 1m and 100k and I just wanted to show you what the difference was. So we've still got the same ratio between them, this kind of tenth of the value of this one, which means that we'll still get the same bias voltage here. But this one's going to draw a little less current through it. So you're going to get a little bit uh, less boost. So if I uh, flick it back to the original resistors, we should see that our boost is actually increased compared to this biasing circuit. And this could very well be, there you go, you can see we're getting a bit more boost. This could very well be why they've gone back to using these resistor values in the modern circuit. So that's why those resistor values are on some schematics that you'll find online, as well as these ones. Now I would say you can use anything in between these values. So 430 and 43k isn't a value you usually get if you just buy a resistor kit you're more likely to get 470 and 47, and you can use those values there as long as that ratio is the same. 
I probably wouldn't go any higher than one meg though because you'll start to affect the amount of boost you can get out of the circuit and don't go too low as well because of what we discussed in the first video about the current on the base versus the current on the collector. So hopefully that helps to explain that slight change of resistor in some versions of this circuit. I talked about some other versions of this circuit at the beginning and how being a common emitter amplifier can be used for multiple applications. We've looked at a few of them in this video. Let's have a look on reverb. Let's see if we can find the ego boost, which is one of them. And there's no listings for at the moment. Let's have a look at this one. Here you go, here's the ego microphone booster. And have we got any shots of the inside? No, unfortunately not. But this is basically the exact same circuit, but here it's used as a microphone booster. Same thing going on inside. Um, let's have a look at the LPB2. Here's the linear power booster too. Sometimes on these listings, you get shots of the inside of these pedals, but unfortunately we're not getting any. Um, but again, exactly the same circuit in here as well, just designed in a guitar box, basically. Um, let's see if we can find an original hog's foot. Have a look at that one. Ah, here we are, the hog's foot bass booster. This is what it looked like. Uh, you'll be familiar with the uh, layout here. Uh, no internal shot either, unfortunately. Um, and let's have a look at the mole. The mole bass booster. Here's an original. And you'll be familiar with the layout of this pedal again. Very similar. Oh, and here's some. Here's one with some uh, internal. So you can see here, it was basically all wired together, like lead to lead inside. There's no PCB or anything. Um, but you'll note the one, two, three, there'll be a fourth resistor in there somewhere. There it is, four. Here's our transistor. And then the two electrolytic capacitors exactly as the circuit that we tried th during this video. So that's just a few of the things you can do with this common emitter amplifier circuit in the form that we've been looking at it in. It's developed over the years and components have been added to meet modern specifications. So let's have a look inside a modern version and see all the extra components in there. Okay, so this is one of the versions of the modern linear power booster circuit. And let's have a look at all the extra things going on here. So first of all, let's identify our original circuit, the one we've been looking at. It's here on the circuit board. So everything outside of that is extra components. So you've got another 100K resistor there. You've got a 2M2 there, a 10K there. You've got a bunch of 100 picofarad capacitors there, there, and there's a hidden one down here. Then you've got this ferrite bead here, and here, and here. Then you've got a diode here, and another capacitor there, and then this extra capacitor as well. So all in all, we've got quite a few extras here. We've got three ferrite beads, We've got three 100 picofarad capacitors. We've got one 47 microfarad capacitor. We've got another 100 nanofarad capacitor. We've got a 1N4001 diode. Um, that's that one there. We've got uh, a 10K, a 100K, and a 2M2 resistor. 
So next video, let's come back and do a deep dive into this circuit here and see what all these extra components are for in the modern version of the linear power booster and its derivatives. I'll see you in the next one.